Here with Reaction, author of See Something, Say Nothing, a Homeland Security officer exposes the government's submission to jihad. Former DHS employee Philip Haney. Philip, now you worked, you started working for DHS in what, 2003, correct? Yes, it was a, I was a founding member of DHS. And part of your job is, is you were looking for terror ties. For example, you would identify people with terror links. In the early 2000s, you were profiling people with links to all of these terror groups. That was your job, right? Yes, we were connecting the dots. We were focusing on individuals and organizations, networks across both the United States and with affiliations in foreign countries. Then six years into your tenure, in 2009, you were ordered to scrub the records of Muslims with these terror ties by our government. That's Who told you to do that? I was directed from DHS headquarters. It's important to keep in mind that that was one year after the November 2008 Holy Land Foundation trial, the largest terror trial in American history, that irrefutably proved that these individuals from the Muslim Brotherhood front groups were uh, in direct financial support of Hamas. And, and that's, so they knew. That, that's, the, that's the trial where CARE was named as an unindicted co-conspirator, if I'm not mistaken. As along with Islamic Society of North America and the North American Islamic Trust, two, three major groups. Okay, so you were doing your job identifying individuals. You built up a computer database. Obama becomes president. You are literally ordered to scrub the names of Muslims with terror ties that we, you had worked so hard to find. You believe you could have stopped what happened in Orlando and San Bernardino had you not been ordered by Obama's DHS to do this. Is that true? Well, that was the first, what I call the first great purge. That was in 2009 with more than 800 records. The case that I'm referring to about stopping the San Bernardino and now related to the Orlando was, was three years later in 2012. It was a larger case called the Tablighi Jamaat Initiative. And it was another network separate from, but related to in some ways, the Muslim Brotherhood network that we just talked about. So in the case of San Bernardino, it was Saeed Farouk and his wife you had identified that mosque as a place where you believe we should have been paying attention to, correct? There's an entire, yes, there's an entire network of those kind of mosques across the United States. And I found out a couple of days ago that the mosque in, in Fort Pierce is also related to the same network. Let me, Two let me big cases now. Let me ask you bluntly, could San Bernardino, but you were doing this great work, and I applaud you for what you have done. You were told to scrub, literally, the records of Muslims with terror ties. You had to do your job or you'd be fired. Do you believe in your heart that the information you had gathered, if you had kept that information, you might have been able to prevent the, the terrorist attacks in both San Bernardino and Orlando? Well, to clarify, I wasn't told to scrub. My agency deleted them themselves. But yes, I, I believe I have a, prop, a plausible premise that we could have stopped it by two major ways. Either Syed Farouk would have been put on the no-fly list and not allowed to travel, or his pending fiance would have been denied a visa because of his affiliation with an organization with plausible ties to terrorism. That's two, at least two different so, ways. Can I, can I repeat this one it. other way? You did your job, and other people did their jobs, and in comes the Obama administration, and they wipe out all the work that could have potentially saved the lives of Americans. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it's a fair statement. I, my records were tagged, and I got an email from all 67 of them when they were deleted, and they came back to my inbox exactly the moment when they were entirely deleted from the system. Oh, my God. Uh, this is unconscionable. Phil Haney, thank you for telling the truth and speaking out. We appreciate it. You're welcome. It shocks the I want to begin my questioning with Mr. Haney. And I would note, Mr. Haney, that I think your testimony before this subcommittee today is, is exceptionally important. And I would commend both members of the media and members of the American public to examine your testimony closely. Because you have described a systematic policy, uh, indeed, of scrubbing, sanitizing, erasing references to radical Islam uh, indeed, you described in your oral testimony that as the, quote, first great purge, where 876 documents were edited by the FBI to remove references 
to radical Islamic terrorism. And, and am I understanding your testimony cor correctly that the administration has been systematically scrubbing law enforcement and intelligence materials to remove references to radical Islam? Yes, it happened a year after the Holy Land Foundation trial when it was proven in federal court irrefutably that these networks were tied to financial support of Hamas. The 800 and plus records that I was ordered to modify, removing all the linking information out of the system called TEX, were virtually all linked directly to the Muslim Brotherhood network of individuals and organizations established right here in the United States. And Mr. Haney, I want to draw your attention to the following chart that compares the 9-11 Commission report, which had 126 references to, to jihad, 145 references to the word Muslim, and 322 references to Islam. Now, if we fast forward to the FBI counterterrorism lexicon, we see the relevant numbers are zero, zero, and zero. Suddenly, jihad, Muslim, and Islam have disappeared. They have likewise disappeared from the National Intelligence Strategy in 2009, zero, zero, and zero. From the Strategic Implementation Plan to Prevent Violent Extremism, zero, one, one slipped in apparently, zero. And finally, the National Intelligence Strategy, 2014. Is this pattern of Orwellian editing of law enforcement and national security materials consistent with your experience and what you observed helping protect this nation? Yes, the first great purge I referred to was in 2009, but that wasn't the last one. There was another great purge in 2012 when they didn't just modify the records, they completely eliminated them out of the system which com bypasses the security protocol for the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, it may not have mattered except for one tragic c consequence. The masjid in San Bernardino and the one in Fort Pierce were directly related to the case of those 67 records that were deleted out of the system. Mr. Haney, would you elaborate on, on how potentially focusing on this threat might have helped prevent the San Bernardino terrorist attack or the Orlando terrorist attack? The networks are made up of individuals and organizations. In individuals don't exist without a network of organizations. You have to look at both of them. That's why there's no such thing as a lone wolf terrorist, because they don't function in a vacuum outside the, the, the uh, structure of the community, just like planets don't rotate around the sun without the gravitational force to hold them in place. So to look at these acts as separate from the community is a, is a flaw, because we're looking, first of all, at tactics not strategy. The strategy is implementation of Sharia law. If we only look on tactics, they are kaleidoscopic and they will change constantly and we can never acquire a target. If we understand that the underlying strategy of the global Islamic movement, then we understand why these organizations exist in the first place. And then we understand why the people that go there are going to be affected by that gravitational force, if you will, and orbit their lives around that central structure. That's why the mosque in Fort Pierce is called Islamic Center, because it provides a center to their life. The person who's going to give us some inside information tonight is Philip Haney. Good evening, Philip. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Glad so to be Philip, here. So, Philip, uh, everybody knows, hopefully knows, that you're uh, officially a whistleblower. And... Uh, that you were uh, Fox News talking about important things, that you wrote a book, she said something, say nothing. Uh, why don't you give us, an, uh, just for some of the people who may not know, maybe start with the picture on the, on the right side of the screen. And uh, what were you doing there? And give a little bit about your background before we jump into your, uh, your commentary. Well, I, uh, I think that might have been when I was on Megyn Kelly. Uh, the first time I ever went public, no pressure whatsoever. I'm only on Fox News with the primetime talk show host, Megyn Kelly, talk, telling the entire country that the narrative about the San Bernardino attacks as the Obama administration was promoting it was false. That there really was a design behind the attack and that there was a particular group called Tabligi Jamaat that was involved. And of course, what, have, what would have happened to my uh, public career if I had been wrong? 
that would have been it for me because the Department of Homeland Security, they said, we're not going to comment except to say that his story is full of holes. Well, you just did comment. But my story wasn't full of holes. A week later, it was verified by the FBI that it actually was to Bleaky Jamaat. Hmm. So I said something that essentially virtually nobody knew. And why in the world would I know that? Why am I so special? It's not that I was so special. It just so happens that I worked at the National Targeting Center in Washington, D.C. on the very case called the Tablighi Jamaat Initiative that pointed me in that direction. And this is the very case that Hillary Clinton, and I said that specifically, Hillary Clinton, and J Janet Napolitano, who was Secretary of Homeland Security, intruded into the law enforcement arena and shut the case down, the Tablighi Jamaat case. And it led to people dying. And that's why I'm so adamant about this. I wish I could talk about gardening and green beans and tomatoes and how beautiful it is here in California, even during the power outage. But no, because this whole issue has not been resolved to this day. And that's basically what we're going to talk about today. If anything, and this is a hard statement for any of me to make, it's worse now than it even was during the Obama administration. And I know people are going to say, what? That can't be possible. President Trump is in. Well, one way to look at it is just imagine how much worse it would be if President Trump wasn't in. But even with his presence and in the administration we have now, the saturation level of the Islam, is particularly the Muslim Brotherhood, but not only, is actually worse, broader and deeper now than it was even during my time active duty in the Department of Homeland Security. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Philip, why don't you get your presentation up while we chat for a minute. Uh, the picture on the right also was in addition to that, your presentation, you're testifying at a hearing uh, in 2016 before a committee entitled, uh, I believe you're looking at uh, willful blindness in, uh, at that time. And I think you commented earlier off the air that uh, uh, you would think with that kind of exposure that you provided your country, things would have gotten better and they've gotten worse. So we're going to invite you to, to uh, give us uh, the latest on maybe willful blindness or whatever else is driving uh, definite blindness. And another thing we talked about off camera before the show started that I've just remembered to mention is that I could actually give you a parallel presentation to this one, which is all based on available open source information, right? I could actually put one right side by side that would be classified, which means what? Why would I bring that up? Because um, the level of saturation is even deeper than what I can show in an open source presentation. But it also implies that this information ought to be and actually is known within law enforcement circle, but that the previous administration basically crashed a tank through the walls of our agency and destroyed a lot of our capacity to protect our national security and our border. That's why I call it national security meltdown. So just keep in mind that if I was, if I had the opportunity, I was sitting before the Intel Committee or the House Committee on Homeland Security or the Judiciary Committee, both on the House or the Senate side, not to mention the cabinet or President Trump himself, I could actually show even more detail of this than what we're going to see tonight. Okay, well, I think that's a key message. Everything you're looking at tonight, everybody, is public source information. That means you can hear it, you can see it. It also means that the people who go to work in Washington, D.C., can see it, see it and hear it if they choose to and, and ask uh, for more information. So, so Philip, why don't you dive in and uh, get started and we'll, uh, we'll uh, invite people to submit questions for uh, analysis at the end. Okay, and this is going to be available on the website, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So everybody that's watching it can go and find the original sources. You don't have to fumble around for it. It's all right there, one-stop shopping. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. As you see, the title of the presentation tonight is National Security Meltdown. I'm calling it Islamic Saturation. 
I'm going to be mainly focusing on the Muslim Brotherhood, but there are other Islamic groups that are saturated into the structure of our, our government, and that would include uh, Hezbollah, and it would also include elements from Turkey uh, under Erdogan. So let me go ahead. These are the different parts of the federal government that the Muslim Brotherhood is saturated into. We'll look at the FBI. I'm going to give you examples of each one of these. And the reason why I didn't put them in alphabetical order is because this is the order of the slideshow. I put it in chronological order because I have found it's easier to follow a story when it's put in chronological order. So in chronologically, the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamic groups began the saturation into federal government through the FBI and then into Congress, and after that, academia, and then after that, the military, and then into my former agency, DHS, and then into the United States State Department of State, and then into the faith community, and by this time, it's obvious we're out of the federal government, we're out into the community now, and then last, it's actually saturating, lapping on the toes of the White House itself. And again, I know people might say, what? you got to be kidding me. That can't really be true. Please tell me that you're just uh, exaggerating. Well, I wish I was. And I also want to mention that there is hope. There are things that we can do. If there wasn't hope, then there wouldn't be a, much of a reason for me to really bring this to light, would there? If it was already a past hope and past resolution, past a solution, then why would I want to bring it up? So yes, I am hopeful. It's sobering. It's discouraged. It's, it's uh, troubling, but it's not hopeless. So we're going to start, as I mentioned, with the FBI. And going back clear to the year 2003, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, that's MPAC, which later I'll show you, uh, is a direct outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood out of Orange County, California, met with Robert Mueller, and other members of the FBI in Washington, D.C. And it says right here on the screen, during a 90-minute meeting, MPAC offered 10 points to enhance the partnership between American Muslim organizations and law enforcement and two suggestions to work jointly with media. So they got all the bus bases covered. Remember, this isn't that long after 9-11. And by this time, uh, this wasn't the first time that they had met with Robert Mueller and the FBI. And isn't it interesting that Robert N Mueller's name surfaces so prominently all those years later when he is in charge of the investigation on collusion with Russia against the Trump administration. And also down here near the bottom, it says the Islamic Society of North America, Representative Muhammad Majid Ali, also endorsed impact stand and express a desire to work jointly with impact to facilitate implementation of these points at the local level. Doesn't it all sound nice? But this is the Muslim Brotherhood, friends. Now this is 2003. This is before the Holy Land Foundation, which was, that trial was concluded in November. We're coming up on the anniversary of it, of 2008. So, okay, we'll cut everybody a little bit of slack. This is 2003 five years before the Holy Land trial, so I'll be nice, and we'll cut him some slack. But there's gonna come a point in the presentation, we're gonna come up to that point of 2008, and then we're gonna go past it, and then you're gonna to begin to ask yourself, well, you cut him some slack before, but what about after the trial? We should know better. And that's why I say that in some ways, it's worse now than it was during Obama, the saturation, because we should know better. It's like the seatbelt principle. If you get in an accident and you're not wearing your seatbelt and you survive it, that's bad. But if you go back out and start driving around again and get in another accident without, and this time you're still not wearing your seatbelt, that's a whole different story. You didn't learn anything from the first experience you had. And so that's why I call it worse because by this time we should have known better. We should have had our seatbelt on as we're driving around because there's more than enough evidence. I'm not the only one that's been trying to bring this to light. 
at great risk, by the way. So here we go, fast forward for about five years, and we're up to 2008 now. This is right before the conclusion of the Holy Land trial, which was held in Dallas by the Department of Justice. Yep, the same Department of Justice that uh, became an active, active supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood not very long after this. This is the famous memo where it talks about uh, the FBI not working with CARE. So right now, before the trial is even concluded, FBI has already been notified that they can no longer work with CARE. So is, is that the way things remain? Is that the way they are now? No, you're gonna see that the FBI is working very closely with CARE in October of 2019. So here we go now. I mentioned this earlier. This is just the icon of the Muslim Brotherhood excuse me, of the Holy Land Foundation. So this trial was concluded November 25th, 2008. That's Thanksgiving Day. And something else significant happened during the month of November 2008. As you might remember, it was called an election. And we elected a new president. His name is Barack Hussein Obama. And this is really, if you want to look at a smoking gun moment in history, in the history of our country regarding national security and border protection, this would be it. The month of November in 2008, which is what now, almost 11 years ago. This is the moment when we came right up to the threat that we were facing and actually touched it. We came right up to the Holy Land Foundation and the network of organizations and front groups operating in the United States, identified them shut one of the major ones down, made a long list of other organizations and individuals, as we call unindicted co-conspirators, and then turned around and walked away from it. And that's the status of it to this day. The second phase of the Holy Land trial has never been followed through. And that was because we had a change in administration and we, we elected a president and an administration from the DOJ on down that rather than approaching the threat we face from a law enforcement orientation, they began to address it from what they call civil rights and civil liberties, countering violent extremism. And that's where the famous or infamous phrase, see something, say something came from. Where we're no longer gonna enforce immigration law, we're not gonna do the screening and the counterterrorism work, we're gonna, we're gonna decide that if we're just friends with them, that they'll be friends with us and, uh, the threat of terrorism will diminish. So here, the day after the election, I mean the verdict with the whole event, CARE comes out, and rather than doing what they always say they do, which is supporting American values, they come out and say that the Holy Land Foundation verdict is based on fear-mongering. Oh, there's nothing really to it. It's all fear-mongering. And this is gonna fast forward too into October of 2019, because now, the new focus of DHS is not counterterrorism as much as it now has become white supremacy. This is kind of a precursor. Oh, they're just fear mongering out of Islamophobia and racist. Uh, there's no basis for their fear of Islam. And they're just arresting and putting these people in the jail because it, it, you know there's nothing really there. And that's how they portrayed it. Of course, there really was something there. These individuals who were convicted are still in jail to this very day. And um, the Holy Land Foundation was responsible for somewhere between 12 and $60 million worth of support, direct financial support to Hamas, which is a globally designated terrorist organization and remains so to this very day. Now here, is when things start to really get gnarly. Now back here, we're at 2008. Now we fast forward another five years. Remember, I'm active duty this whole time. I came, I was a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security, right clear back before impact started re reaching or meeting with Robert Mueller. That was March 1st, 2003 is when the uh, Department of Homeland Security was inaugurated. I was there literally on the first day, already been in federal service for more than a year before then. 
The agency was inaugurated March 1st, 2003. MPAC is already meeting, Muslim Brotherhood is already meeting with officials in the law enforcement branches like FBI and DOJ. Here comes our agency in 2003. And then 10 years later, look at this very carefully. This is a written statement of the Council on American Islamic Relations, a front group for Hamas, on what? The Boston Marathon bombings. They called it a first look. Submitted to who? The United States House Committee on Homeland Security, May 9th, 29, 2013. Remember the bombings in Boston were April 15th. So this is like not even a month. And the Department of Homeland Security under Mike McCall, Texas House member, chairman of the House Committee, had hearings on the Boston Marathon bombing. And they solicited, meaning requested, the care would submit an official analysis or official briefing on the Boston Marathon. I talked directly with the vice chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security, Jeff, Jeff Duncan from um, South Carolina. And I told him directly to his face that they had a Trojan horse inside their committee. And he looked at me and said, why? How can you say that? I said, because CARE submitted a report to your committee. CARE is a front group for Hamas. The only way that CARE would ever submit a report like this is if they were requested to, if it was solicited. That means somebody in your committee asked them to do it. And that's why you have a Trojan horse in your committee. And that is what, how many years ago was that? Six years. So here's an example of the Muslim Brotherhood being saturated in the Congress. And you might think, well, that was the end of it. Was It got better, right? No. Here I found out was where the Trojan horse was coming from. This is about two years later after that. To Mustafa Carroll and the Council on American Islamic Relations, the moderate Muslim is our most effective weapon. Mike McCall, Chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security, Texas District 10. Mustafa Carroll is the leader of CARE in Texas. So why, please tell me. Keeping in mind now, chronologically, this is seven years-ish after the Holy Land trial had been completed and we'd already proven that CARE was one of the front groups for Hamas. So why would the chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security be meeting with the leader of an organization that was already proven in federal court to be con directly connected to Hamas. Please, somebody explain that. Well, I kept asking that question, including to Mike McCall himself in person, eye to eye. And the, the fruit of my labors was that I ended up getting investigated by my own colleagues within my own agency, Internal Affairs of CBP, the Department of Homeland Security, Inspector General, and the Department of Justice, who convened a grand jury to find probable cause to indict me on criminal charges for pointing out inconvenient facts like, wait a minute, why is Mike McCall meeting with a member of CARE, who we know. Meanwhile, we go forward a little bit, and everywhere you turn, you find CARE, and they're always objecting to something. Here in this case, they're objecting to a billboard that says Muslims to Muslims see something, say something save innocent lice. They don't even like that. Even though the Obama administration paid them money to be model communities in the city of Boston, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and LA, California, when it was all said and done, they turned around and betrayed the very administration that supported them and said that the See Something, Say Something campaign was biased, discriminatory, and uh, that it counterproductive and racist and denounce the entire program. So anytime you bring Muslim activities into the public light, one of these Muslim Brotherhood front groups is gonna rise up and make a big stink about it. Most of the time, it's CARE. Occasionally it's other groups, but CARE is like the frontline activists. They're out there at street level, making sure that, that, they, that they put a stop to any attempt to examine the real motives of, let's say, Islamic extremism. 
So now fast forward to 2018. Now we're getting into real recent times. This is like not quite a year ago. The IPT, the Investigative Project for Terrorism, put out a list of what? 102 members of Congress who written letters to care on official stationery. Just like this one I have here for an example. There are 102 members of the House. Now this was a year ago. And as I go forward, you're gonna see another slide to show, now we've discovered, and I'm trying to find the source of it, another cache of letters, this is a year later, meaning now, of 125 letters that have been written to CARE from members of Congress in commemoration of their upcoming 25th annual banquet. They're gonna celebrate their 25th birthday and they're going to have this banquet in Washington, D.C. on the 9th of November, about, what, 12 days from now. And 125 different members of Congress have written letters congratulating CARE on their 25-year anniversary. So we have two caches of letters written by members of Congress. And another thing to keep in mind, these are the very same members of Congress who are right now attempting to impeach the president. So we have members of Congress who are supporting Hamas while they're same, at the same time attempting to impeach the president. That's why I call it a national security meltdown. Here is a screenshot of the pending banquet and look at some of the luminaries that are gonna be speaking. I know you all are aware of Linda Sarsour and you also, I think you probably all heard of Ilhan Omar too. Well, there are two of the women that are speaking at this event. And what's the title of it? Defending, Educating, and Empowering, Building the Next Generation of American Muslims. This is front group for Hamas. I have to keep saying that. And that members of Congress who write letters in support of CARE or another Muslim Brotherhood front group like MPAC or ISNA are supporting Hamas. And they need to be, they need to be held accountable for this. They need to be challenged on this. And that'll be one thing everybody watching and listening can do. You can write a letter and you can make a phone call. Once I get done with this presentation and you get a hold of the PowerPoint, go to the sources where these letters where I found them, look them up yourself and look up which ones of them are your representatives and give them a phone call. I mean, like tomorrow. So meanwhile, we hear undercurrents that President Trump is considering designating the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. Well, this bubbles up to the surface every so often. There's some debate, even within our circle, within our alliance, about whether the Muslim Brotherhood quiet qualifies under technical rules to be designated as a terrorist group. But I can tell you that other countries in other parts of the world, particularly in the Middle East, who know the Muslim Brotherhood quite well, have already taken a step to designate them, including President al-Sisi from Egypt, who is hoping that President Trump is going to back him up and designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist group here in America. And if we didn't designate the Muslim Brotherhood, maybe we could reinstate the Holy Land Foundation trial. And if we didn't reinstate the Holy Land Foundation trial part two, maybe we could look into some of the deeper level activities of these front groups that are still, to this very day, connected to, the, the, to Hamas and other front groups, global level, that are supporting the jihad in a lot of different places around the world. My point is there's plenty that we can do. We don't have to just sit here and take it passively until God forbid something bad happens. And then maybe we react at that point and wring our hands and try to ask ourselves, oh gosh, now what can we do? Now there's a lot that we can do. Now I mentioned that they're saturated in academia. And this is just one example of the Institute for Islamic uh, Education called the Barzinji Project that is coupled with a uh, college is right in Virginia called Shenandoah University. Now the IIIE, the, the International Institute for Islamic Education is a very well-known front group. It's actually not funny 
pitiful actually it's about a mile and a half from the ntc where i where i call the secret squirrel headquarters of dhs near reston virginia at least it used to be there about a mile and a half from that is the headquarters of one of the biggest branches of the muslim brotherhood in the whole united states right next door to each other and they they're forming partnerships with schools and coming in saturating in providing education uh, that is pro-Islamic, pro-Muslim Brotherhood, and having influence on the lives of these young students. I also mentioned that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, in this case CARE, had forced itself or saturated itself into the Department of Defense. And this is a infamous case just quite recently in June of this year, where they forced the cancellation of a speech presentation by Raymond Ibrahim. Out of all places, uh, the U.S. Army War College. The U.S. Army War College chose to be in, allow themselves to be intimidated and coerced by a front group for Hamas and cancel the speech by one of the best well-known Arab-speaking scholars of Islamic uh, theology and the global uh, Islamic movement in the whole world, Raymond Ibrahim. Now that's a lot of influence. Now we're getting into really current times. This is where the rubber is really starting to meet the road now because on June 28th of this year, at Muslim Public Affairs Council was invited to participate in a workshop called Protecting Houses of Worship. And it says down here in the highlighted part in the left pane of the slide, that we will be advising the Department of Homeland Security and other law enforcement agencies on how to best protect Muslim communities and other religious groups. Then you go to the top of the right-hand pane, it says our role in this limited scope subcommittee, limited scope subcommittees meant they were chosen particularly to be part of this emerging policy to highlight the external threats posed by violent what white supremacist groups against our houses of worship and communities they're going to be asking for more money more law enforcement and a real strong focus on white supremacist violence against all americans and who do they say in this next highlighted paragraph in order to send a comprehensive and inclusive report to DHS, there's another report coming, we will be collaborating with organizations like CARE and Muslim leaders across the U.S. to ensure that the recommendations we provide are diverse and includes the impact on vulnerable communities. We aim to serve each part of our community's needs. This is blatant. This is why I say it's worse. I documented 150 meetings between the Obama administration and groups like Impact, ISNA, Islamic Society of North America, and CARE during the term time of President Obama's uh, term in office. We already know, which I'll show you in a sec here. By the way, that circle on the right of the slide, that's the FBI. So the DHS is partnering up with the FBI. But wait a minute, I thought the FBI wasn't supposed to be working with CARE way back as long as 2009. That's 10 years ago. Well, why is CARE emerging back into the picture along with impact and being invited to participate in the development of a new policy focused on white supremacy? When we already know from 10 years ago, they're part of the Muslim Brotherhood and that they're affiliated with Hamas. So, Here's a little bit of background on impact in case anybody listening isn't quite sure that impact really does come from the Muslim Brotherhood. They were founded by two brothers, the Hatha brothers who immigrated here from Egypt. And they were very outspoken. They weren't shy one little bit about saying that they were uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood. They come from Orange County, California. The Islamic Center of Southern California, which is a hot spot out in the west of the Muslim Brotherhood activity, just like the Islamic Society of Boston is a hot spot on the East Coast. And that they're directly de derived from Muslim Brotherhood. So it's not a mystery. 
And here's Majid Ali, the guy on the right, with, uh, I'm sure you all recognize who that person is, Comey, James Comey. Another one of the people that are out after to try to destroy President Trump's presidency. So this is the former president of the Muslim Islamic Society of North America, Majadi, Majadi Lee, who is also on the advisory committee of, of, uh, of sorry for stuttering. He's on the advisory committee of the Assembly of Muslim Jurists for America, which is called Majama Fukaha al-Sharia bi-Amrikiya in Arabic. And these are the promoters of Sharia. This basically the sun that the whole Muslim community orbits around in North America, and the, the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, AMJA, is what the acronym is. That's Majid Ali. Why is he standing next to uh, of James Comey? I thought they weren't supposed to be working with these people. So where's the disconnect? That's why I call it saturation. Now here we are in the faith community. This is July 17th, 2019. And there's this whole movement called the Alliance of Virtue for the Common Good, which is a initi initiative initiative begun by the Muslim Brotherhood out of Jordan in the year 2006. It used to be called the Common Word. Now it's called Alliance of Virtue for the Common Good. And if you look at the highlighted places, people down at the bottom, you'll see Imam Majid. He's the Imam of the Dulles Adam Center there in all Dulles area Muslim Society Center outside of Washington, D.C., allied with David Saperstein and Bob Roberts, a Baptist pastor, but led by this guy up here, Sheikh Ben Baya, who is a high-level person in the Muslim Brotherhood who lives in Saudi Arabia. They've come right into what is called the ministerial, which is an an effort generated out of the State Department to help protect persecuted Christians. So how is it that these people have managed to separate, saturate themselves right into even this part of our social structure? In this case, it's out of the State Department, but it's supposed to be protecting Christians from persecution. And the very people that are doing the persecuting them now are sitting in the position of authority. And here's CARE. They were going to be partnering with the Census Bureau. And that's as of August 28, 2019. But IPT with Stephen Emerson put the word out and thank the Lord. Somebody actually listened and they canceled the proposed affiliation between CARE and the 2020 Census. And this is one of the reasons why I say there's hope. Because with the properly directed uh, focus and effort, there is a chance that people in the administration actually will listen and reconsider. And, and this is one example of it. However, here you have September 6, 2019. You have the US CMO, C in blue, US CMO. That's the US Council on Muslim Organizations. The guy second from the right is Nihad Awad. The guy next to him is Yusama Jamal. These are all high-level Muslim Brotherhood leaders. These are the top of the whole United States. The U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations is the largest coalition of leading national and local Muslim organizations. What are they doing at the State Department? Meeting with officials from the State Department on our policy regarding Kashmir. You know, there's a big conflict going on right now between India and Pakistan over the status of what's called Jammu and, and Kashmir. And the U.S. CMO is coming in on the side of Pakistan, advocating for uh, the position that Pakistan takes that Jammu and Kashmir should be part of their territory, not part of India. It's a potential huge conflict. But the point is, is why is the Muslim Brotherhood even allowed to come within 50 feet of the US State Department, but they are. And as I said to you earlier when I first started, if I could show you classified information on every single one of the people in this picture, you really would be horrified. And you would be asking me, who in the world is doing the vetting? 
And where is the disconnect between, let's say, the State Department and the Department of Homeland Security, the law enforcement branch of the federal government? How come they're not talking to each other? Why is it these people that have known connections and ties to terrorist activity through the Muslim Brotherhood and front groups and organizations like Hamas allowed to go in and sit shoulder to shoulder with people that are in the State Department in real time? This isn't years ago. This is last month. And here's this same task force that I was mentioning to you before. Now, here's the new emerging strategy. The official policy of the Department of Homeland Security dated September 20th, 2019, endorsed by McAleenan, who was the Secretary of Homeland Security, but just resigned about two weeks ago. And on the left, I just put this in and mention that we're not the only country that's having this problem of trying to tell what the difference between our left hand and our right hand. They're having the same problem in the UK. They're shifting their focus from counterterrorism to what they consider a greater threat, which is white supremacy. Then the point is, who is going to be the arbiter of what a white supremacist is? The Muslim Brotherhood. It's an astonishing irony. This highlighted part says the strategic framework clearly elucidates the nature of today's domestic challenges, including providing extended assessment of the dangers posed by what? Domestic terrorists, including radical, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists, and particularly, and I love when government officials use per certain words, because I can just picture when they were sitting around a table putting this uh, document together, they put, they stress, particularly white supremacist violent extremism. That's coming right out of the mouth of the Muslim Brotherhood right onto this paper. I can guarantee you just knowing the way they work. And down at the bottom, the strategic framework emphasizes the importance of transparency and the protections of civil rights and civil liberties and the protection of data in a digital age. This is right back to what I got in so much trouble for. And this is what See Something, Say Something is all about. And it's also what uh, countering violent extremism. So this is a hybrid. This is a, this is a concentrated form of all of the policies that have come before under Obama, under Napolitano, under Jay Johnson, concentrated into a new just released strategy that they're going to put all their effort and focus and attention on white supremacy and here's some more information on that at the request of dhs and we're trying to make this clear this is not passive accidental or, or arbitrary the department of homeland security a very agency that i used to work for that was found in order to prevent terrorism is now bringing the very same organ individuals and organizations into the heart of their policy making structure and refocusing their efforts on white supremacy as endorsed and supported by secretary former secretary now McAleenan. and here's some more information on that and i just highlighted this blue part Today is National Awareness Day for the If You See Something, Say Something campaign. Now, this is September 25th, just about a month ago. And why I brought this up again is I wanted to point something out. In all the years that we've heard see something, say something, we've never actually been told what we're supposed to be looking for or what we're supposed to say if we do see something. But now that problem has been solved because we now have a safe target that everybody can go, go, go look for, and there's no risk to making a report on it, reporting somebody, and that is a white supremacist. It's no long, you know, you remember what happened several times over when people said that they were afraid of reporting their neighbors who happened to be Muslim because they were afraid that they were going to be accused of being racist, biased, Islamophobes, remember? Like in San Bernardino. Well, that problem is solved now because it's a safe target to go after white supremacists. And in the middle of it are Muslim Brotherhood front groups that are right there given the endorsement and the support and the entree, the cachet, the prestige 
to be, in a sense, partners with DHS as we fight this threat of white supremacy. Well, you know they've already called President Trump a white supremacist. They call ICE white supremacists. They call law enforcement officers that are attempting to enforce immigration law white supremacists. They call virtually all cops white supremacists. They call anybody that stands up and speaks about the global Islamic movement a white supremacist. So imagine where this would go if somebody among us, all of us together, don't stand up and bring this to attention and ask them to explain what this is really supposed to all be about. And earlier I showed you a report that was submitted by CARE to the House Committee on Homeland Security back in 2013 after the Boston Marathon. Well, if you wondered if it's still going on, the answer is yes. This is the Judiciary Committee on the left. That's Jerry Nadler, remember him? He's one of the three main members of the House that are, have committees that are going after uh, President Trump to try to impeach him, Jerry Nadler. Well, his committee is the, is the Judiciary Committee. They just had hearings on President Trump's anti-Muslim policies aka the Immigration Enforcement Act that he signed as an executive order clear back like one or two days after he became president. Well, who is asked to submit a report? Once again, CARE. Jerry Nadler, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, specifically asked CARE on the 24th of September 2019 to submit a report in the official proceedings of the hearing to the Judiciary Committee. So yes, it's still going on at this very moment. Now, on the right, I mentioned this guy before, is Usama Jamal. He's the person looking down, probably at his cell phone. And there's Erdogan from Turkey. This is September 22nd. Usama Jamal is the chairman of the USCMO, the ones that just met at the State Department, the US Council on Muslim Organizations. Right? So then what happens? We have this Faith-Based Community Safety and Security Symposium, this, this high level, was attended by Mike Pence, Congressman John Joyce, and Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Assistant Director Brian Harrell, with several faith-based community leaders for a Faith-Based Safety and Security Symposium at where? The White House. And who were the people that were at this sitting literally right next to my Vice President Pence? The members of the Muslim Brotherhood. The same people I showed you before. And here's a description of it. This is what I call saturation. Like water soaking into a sponge. So my simple question is, why is it? 18 years after 9-11 and coming up on 11 years after the Holy Land Foundation trial, that known, documented, identified members of Muslim Brotherhood front groups, leaders of them, are being brought in to positions within the federal government to influence policy and then turn around and go out into the community and begin to implement it. Why is it, please tell me, that these individuals are being allowed to literally sit right next to the president, to officials within DHS, within FBI, within the State Department, within the Department of Defense, within the academic community, within the faith community. What is it going to take for us to actually respond to this, to this emerging threat? Just, just a couple things that I wanted to put as consequences of this new policy. The DOJ, yes, the Department of Justice, is suing the city of Troy in Detroit because they had the audacity to try to enforce their zoning laws. And so CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations, filed a suit against the city council of Troy. And guess who's helping them? The Department of Justice. Specifically, the Civil Rights Division, you see at the bottom of the second paragraph, that Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Division, we have one inside of DHS too. 
And they're the ones that set up the liaison meetings that brought the Muslim Brotherhood right into the inner heart of uh, my agency, DHS Customs and Border Protection. So it's, it's not just happening in one agency, it's happening across the broad spectrum where these Muslim Brotherhood front groups are getting co-opting, influencing, somehow or another subtly seducing them into undermining the legal structure of our whole country by going and suing cities because they have zoning laws that prevent uh, putting a, a public building like a mosque in a particular part of their city. And here's another one. See, it shows you right here that Chair Michigan, representing the Adam Community Center in the lawsuit, praised the Justice Department's action. Please tell me again. I know I sound like a broken record, but will somebody please explain what it is that a front group for Hamas is doing, partnering with the Department of Justice? And where are where's all the people that are supposed to know better? That's the part that bothered me the most. Is after all the effort of law enforcement officers like myself to bring this to light, and we still have the highest levels of our government agencies cooperating directly with these people. And then here we all know who this is, Keith Ellison. In response to the new policy that's that's put out by in September of this year by DHS, he's going to turn right around and have a symposium on white nationalism, which of course is a synonym for white supremacy in St. Cloud, Minnesota, after Trump vows more local control. So what they're doing is they're taking this opportunity and leveraging the new policy of DHS and going after communities in the United States that have the courage or the wherewithal to actually try to stand up and protect their own sovereignty. And this is one last thing. This is an upcoming meeting in December out of Charleston, West Virginia called Shoulder to Shoulder, and any of you that know about Shoulder to Shoulder know it's a coalition of left-wing organizations, progressive Christian denominations, and lo and behold, the Muslim Brotherhood. In particular, one of the faces of it is Muhammad Majid Ali, who I've already mentioned to you two or three times, uh, former president of ISNA, a direct high-level representative of the Muslim Brotherhood right here in the United States. And this is, my friends, is the last slide. What are we going to do about it? I already mentioned earlier that you should come and get the PowerPoint, look in the notes, find the link to the letters, go through the list and find a representative, maybe in your state, and give them a phone call. And I would like you to document what you do. In other words, get back with uh, Sharia Crime Stoppers and let them know what kind of a response you got. I am really curious. I would like to know what kind of response you get from your elected officials when you call them and ask them, please explain to me why it is that you are in, uh, involved with the front group for Hamas. Well, we're not involved. Yes, you are. You write letters in support of care which is proven in the Holy Land Foundation trial to be a front group for Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood and see what kind of a response you get. And then go down to Walmart and buy a case of spinach because it's time to open a can. Wouldn't you agree? And I think that's the last slide and I think we're gonna go into questions next. Is that right? Philip, before we do that, why don't you remind us what Popeye would say about all of this. That's why oh. Popeye yeah, I stands all I can stands, and I can't stands no more. <laughs> so we all need to grow forearms like Popeye and uh, pull up our big boy pants and uh, get into action. And we'll talk about that. A couple of footnotes.